The Babylon Project was our last best hope for Scott. A self-contained podcast, one hour long, located on the internet. A place of fun and discussion for Babylon 5 fans everywhere. A shining beacon in cyberspace, all alone in the night. It was the dawn of the 20th anniversary of Babylon 5, the year the great war to free Bab 5 came upon us all. This is the story of the last of the Babylon podcasts. The year is 2014. The name of the place is the Babylon Project Podcast. This is Maggie Egan, your ISN news anchor, and you're listening to the Babylon Project podcast. Thanks for listening. Hi there, Babylon 5 fans. This is Raul and Jim, and we are back with the Babylon Project podcast. How are you doing tonight, my friend? I'm doing well. Been looking forward to recording this one. Actually, I am too. This was a standalone episode for the most part, but it was a fun one. Yes, it definitely was. Uh, Jakar and Londo really, really showed their stripes. Oh, my, yes. That was part of the fun for me. Uh, There was another part that I really enjoyed, and that gets actually into some of the characters. And I think the best way to do that is let's not waste time, and let's just dive right into a summary, okay? Excellent. Archive. Access. Initiated. In by any means necessary, Sinclair finds himself with the dubious task of mediating arguments both large and small. An explosion in one of the station's loading docks takes the life of a worker and injures several others. When Garibaldi investigates the cause of the explosion, he finds that it is due to some defective parts that were used in the construction of the station. The representative of the dock workers, Miss Connolly, approaches Sinclair with demands that the station's unsafe equipment must be replaced and that the workers who are overworked and underpaid need to be compensated better and that other workers need to be hired to maintain safety standards. Sinclair explains that he has repeatedly asked for the necessary funds, but has been turned down numerous times because, according to EarthGov, the funds are simply not available. Connolly explains that she doesn't understand that, since the military seems to get all of the funding they need for the station's operations. The workers threaten to go on strike if their demands are not met. In response to this proposal of an illegal strike, EarthGov sends a tough negotiator, Mr. Zento. Zento and Connolly meet processions that result in an impasse. The workers go on strike, and Zento invokes the Rush Act, which provides that the workers may be arrested and jailed for their illegal strike. Sinclair does some research on the Rush Act and talks to the workers just as a riot is about to break out, when Garibaldi follows his orders to enforce the Rush Act. What Sinclair has learned is that the strike can be ended by any means necessary. When he addresses the workers, he tells them that a large sum will be diverted from the military budget and made available for upgrades to equipment, higher pay, and the hiring of additional workers the workers go back to work. Senator Hidoshi calls Sinclair and tells him that he admires how he settled the dispute, but there are many others in the government who do not, and that he has made some enemies with the actions. In a subplot, Londo and Jakar are at it again. As a Narn transport arrives on the station, another ship is departing, 
and when the Narn pilot attempts to compensate for the computer-caused mistake, it results in the explosion mentioned earlier. On that transport was a Jaquan F-plant that is used for a Narn ritual that has to be held on a particular day at a particular time. Another cannot arrive in time for the rites, so Jakar is upset. He gets even more upset when Londo teases him that there is one of the sacred plants in his possession and will, under no circumstances, allow Jakar to obtain it. After trying unsuccessfully to get the flower from Londo, Jakar enlists the help of Sinclair to try to reason with Londo, who is enjoying making Jakar miserable as usual. Sinclair visits with Londo, who refuses to listen to logic and tells Sinclair that he will not part with the plant. Jakar sends Natoth to steal an item from Londo in return. She takes a statue of an important Centauri god to hold in ransom for J the Jaquan F. Both parties wind up in front of Sinclair, who settles the matter by ordering Jakar to return the statue because it is Londo's property and he orders Londo to hand over the plant because it is a controlled substance and cannot be in the possession of anyone other than the Narn for their religious practices. Londo agrees, saying that he has already gotten his pleasure from the plant. Jakar is pleased that Sinclair has settled the matter, but explains that it is too late for the ritual which must take place when the first light of the Narn sun peaks over a particular mountain. Sinclair explains that the light that reaches the station from Narn will arrive at the station in about 12 hours, because of the distance of the Narn sun from the station. The show closes with Jakar leading the ritual. Initiating Plot Analysis. Thanks again for that summary, Jim. We didn't have a huge guest cast tonight, just a couple. Yeah. They should both be familiar to Star Trek fans, because I know both have done yes. a couple of episodes in the past. But first we had right. John Snyder. Yep, he played Oren Zento, and he made two appearances on Next Generation. Uh, one of them surprised me because I didn't realize it. He played a, a Romulan named Bakra in a geordi centric episode called uh, The Enemy. Okay. And, you know, the part that I actually know him from mostly is his voice acting, which he did a lot of. Oh, yeah. He, in particular, in addition to... Outlaw Star, which was one of my favorites, uh, had a few roles on uh, had a few roles on uh, Cowboy Bebop, mm -hmm. and I think I sent you a few weeks ago a clip of the theme music for Cowboy Bebop. Yeah, I enjoyed that. the The series itself is as good as their music. Mm -hmm. He also appeared on Quantum Leap and Knight Rider. Mm -hmm. So those are some of his sci-fi credentials. He also, as you say, his voice credits are quite extensive. And very impressive. Our other guest star was Katie Boyer as Neoma Connor. And again, she had a, you know, a Star Trek appearance in the past. Yeah, which you wouldn't have even recognized her at because she was a binar. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. In that episode one one zero one 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 zero 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 one one or whatever it's called. <laughs> yeah. Oh my. Uh she's she's done a lot of, you know, basic guest starring character actor type work. Mm -hmm. And I will say this about what she brought to the role of Naomi Connolly. Mm -hmm. Of all the characters to come in and out of Babylon five, she's the one I miss the most in not having her brought back. I loved her character. Yeah, you know what? I just realized I mispronounced her character's name. It's it is Connolly and not Connor. Where did I got I think I got Connor from uh John Snyder's other appearance on Next Generation. Ah. So I kind of messed that one up. The other guest star we don't want to forget though is Aki Aliong as Senator Hidoshi. 
Yes, he he does, and he's in and out throughout. He's yeah. actually worth he's actually worth mentioning here because I am definitely going to mention it. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do I say it? He's probably the, and he's only a recurring character. He's not a main character. He's probably the character I like the least on the show so far. You do really not not the actor. The actor's great. the The actor is absolutely great. The character of Senator Hidoshi, I just don't like him. Ah, I see, don't think. I, I... I don't think you're supposed to like him, though. I don't know. I kind of do. Uh, he uh, strikes me as having Sinclair's back. Only as so far as it's convenient for him. Well, that's a politician in general, though, isn't it? Exactly. You, <laughs> and you, you just got right to it. <laughs> and one other person that we probably should mention is Patricia Healy was back as Marianne Kramer. Our reporter gal. Oh, the the pesty the, ISN news girl. The pesty <laughs> ISN news girl. Yeah. Not to be confused with. Of course, our favorite Maggie Egan. Egan, yeah. My brain just stopped working again. But see, Maggie has class. Exactly. Okay. That other that other one was just kind Marianne of Marianne Kramer pest. is a pest. Yeah. And I'm sure do... she was written that way, but yeah. <laughs> And we do have another recurring character that shows up through the series, and that's Jose Ray playing Eduardo Del Vientos. Ah, the he shows the, up again, huh? The doc. Ah, uh, yes, he does. Let me. In fact, does he come back as the doc boss again? Ah, uh, yes. That's. Oh, neat. Let me find it here. He will be back again in. And now for a word. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, I yeah. believe that's in the middle of season two. Okay. Well, you know what, Raul? The key word for this episode is stressed out. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, when you, when you, especially Sinclair. Yes. I mean, he he just gets more and more ragged as the episode progresses. Well, now, hang on just a second. Does he really? I watched this, oh, I don't know, two or three times. And did you by any chance notice how he he was supposed to look scruffy looking, right? Well, he sometimes was scruffier looking than other times. <laughs> There were periods there where a little, a little where he bit of w- continuity, maybe some pickup shots. You think? Yeah, there was there was a continuity problem, definitely, uh, with his look. He there was one point he looked like he had about a two days growth, and that was in certain scenes. And then there were other scenes where he looked almost clean shaven, and then there were scenes where it looked like he was at some point in between. But they were intercut in such a way that it looked like the guy had to probably shave four or five times a day. <laughs> I did not notice that, but I absolutely no, believe it. I, I'm go, almost going to have to go back and watch it again just to make sure. Go back and look at it, and you'll see. I, you know, I wish I could tell you exactly what scenes there were. I think probably he had the most growth of beard when he was dealing with um with Zento. Yes. That that no, I know what you're talking about. Toward toward the end there with Z- yeah, actually in the middle when he first met Zento it almost seemed like. Yeah. Yeah, just go back and check it out. You'll All notice. Right. All right. You know there is one other person w- connected with the show that does need to be mentioned. Okay. That is Catherine Drennan, the writer yeah, I read of this that. episode. I read that. She is important primarily, well, for two reasons, actually. She wrote To Dream in the City of Sorrows, which of all the Babylon 5 standalone books, if you read, that's the one you have to read. It's the book that starts Marcus's story and 
concludes Catherine Sakai's story, and it is considered canon. Ah. The other reason Catherine Drennan is important is she was Joe Straczynski's wife at that time. It was it was really interesting to read that um, Straczynski did not care for nepotism. No. And held anybody, he said, what did it say in the Lurker's Guide? Anybody that was close to him was... He worked uh, them harder. Yeah, he made them work harder to get accepted. Which means she probably had to work the hardest of all. But I think that's part of what made it such a great episode. Yeah. And let's assume that the same standard was applied to the book because it really is just a brilliant piece of writing. Yeah. I, I'm generally not fond of novelizations in sci-fi universes, you know, that carry over from television or from cinema. Yeah. This book really makes an exception to that. I, I've got to read that. I know I've said that about 40 times. <laughs> that and the uh, Centauri trilogy ah. is the other one that's a, really a must read. Yeah. Stressed out. Back to Sinclair stress Stre out. Yeah. Back to stress. Sinclair yeah. stressed. Susan stressed. Eduardo stressed. Really stressed. Yeah. Narn Captain stressed. Yep. <sighs> And Garibaldi, not yet, but he will be. Uh-huh. Jakar, stressed. I think about the only one who's not stressed f through most of this is Londo. Yeah. He, he seems to be <laughs> quite enjoying himself. Yeah, he's he seems to be quite quite a bit in control. Uh, <laughs> very, It's very funny. So where do you want to start with this? Well... I do have a like and dislike, but I think we'll save that for the end. I know you've got a like yourself that you particularly want to bring up, a quote, I believe. Yes. As I said, the union rep, Ms. Connolly, is really one of the characters I wish they had kept around, at least as an occurring role at some point. Right. But let's go ahead and start with the basic situation. Government hasn't changed in a couple, few hundred years, has it? No, no. Politicians pretty well stay the same. They spend money everywhere except where it matters. <laughs> true, true. And they listen, they listen far too much to the experts than the people who actually know what is going on. Yeah. Well, the lobbyists. Yep. You know. Uh, and, and they listen because that's where they, their funding comes from, you know, and where their voter base is. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why Hidoshi annoys me. Like I had said before, he kept coming back to, well, the experts say, well, the experts say, you know, there's, you know what the definition of an expert is, don't you? Okay. I'll bite. What is it? X is the mathematical symbol for an unknown. Right? Right. Mm -hmm. A spurt is a drop of water under high pressure. Ah. Therefore, an expert is an unknown drip under pressure. Has been drip. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. <laughs> so, well, yeah, I don't know. I Maybe maybe it's because of the actor, but I, I kind of like Hidoshi myself. I, I, he, I can see, I can understand why. I, I can he, understand why. He seems to care about what is going on on Babylon 5. As far as he knows, I think that he likes Sinclair and and kind of watches his back a little bit. Up until the point that it's politically convenient for him to throw him under the bus. Well, yeah, but that's what a military commander is for. At least in the eyes of a politician. Correct. And that, that, I think that comes down to it. Hidoshi's I mean, a politician first. I mean, hasn't that been throughout history? <laughs> yep. MacArthur? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, argu no argument for me. No yeah. argument for me. So, I mean, you know, if uh, 
Operation Overlord hadn't been successful, who would have gotten thrown <laughs> under the bus for that? See, the, 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 this is why I say it's, it, the actor is playing the character right. He, yeah. He's getting the right kind of response from the audience. Yes. <laughs> oh, my. So, anyway, we've got the workers. We've who got the are, workers. Who are working under conditions that are less than ideal. They have equipment that was built by the lowest bidder. It is breaking down. It's not dependable. They are overworked because... And there's not enough workers either. Right. The volume is is very heavy, and there's not enough personnel to handle everything. And as is wanting to happen, there's an accident. Not quite a boom, but they are able to contain the fire before it goes boom. Yeah. And it takes the life of uh, of a young person, which is, which is always very sad. Eduardo's brother, in particular, right? And so you know they're they're rightfully upset. They want the equipment to do the job uh, safely. They want more workers, and they want uh, better pay for themselves, which which is all completely understandable, especially if they're going to be working those long hours. Yeah, and it one thing that's real clear is that Sinclair is completely on their side here. Well, he's he's got he's there. He knows what the situation is. He can right. see it. So he's going to want to definitely take care of operations and make sure they continue to run smoothly. Uh huh. However, there is no money. Yeah, right. He's continually told there is no money. Mm-hmm. There's no politically expedient money. Right. Well, there there isn't a situation to warrant, as far as EarthGov is concerned, there isn't a situation to warrant putting money into it. Everything mm-hmm. seems to be working fine. According to the experts. Right. And, so, and how far away is Earth from Babylon 5? Oh, I forgot. How, you know, they actually have that worked out. And I yeah. don't remember the actual distance, but we're talking light years. Yeah, several light years. Which is amazing several. how Hidoshi finds out what's going on so fast. Well, you know, that, that brings up a question. Is there a mole on board? Good question. I, I know there's more than one because Jakar seems to know everything before most everybody else does. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. But... We have Connolly and Sinclair, even though he's on her side, he's stuck in the position of being on the other side of the negotiating table, right. and his hands are pretty much tied in the negotiations. Well, he's he's got a job to do, and his job is to keep peace on that station and keep things moving. Uh-huh. He has no authority to make decisions on funding. Right. At least not at this point. Yeah, and actually, you know, Hidoshi, Hidoshi, in having Zenko sent out, in one way, looks at this almost as a plus for Sinclair because it takes him out of the hot seat. Yes. Yep. So, what did you think of this Zento person? I liked him better as a soul hunter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, he was he was a second uh, soul hunter. No kidding. See, yes. I didn't realize. I didn't realize that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. He, he I was didn't Soul Hunter that. too. Okay. All right. <laughs> wow. I liked him better as a Soul Hunter. Wow, that's that's quite a quite an endorsement there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I you know I think they chose this actor because of his look. Yep. Absolutely. He's, he, he can he could be very charismatic, but let's face it, uh, he's a hired gun. He's a hired gun. They called him a they called him a negotiator. Right. He was not there to negotiate. He was there to strong arm. Exactly. You know, it's our way or the highway. And that was exactly the approach he took. But what he didn't count on is is a little clause in the Rush Act. Well, let's get let's get back to that that the, the Rush Act. 
what it actually was first. And there's actually a little more to it than just what is mentioned in the show. Uh -huh. Because in the show, what it is described as was a law to end illegal strikes. Okay. But according to Straczynski, it's actually a little more than just that. It's specific to military bases. It came out through the Earth Membari War and was very, very rarely invoked. Right. So he was really strong arming. In other words, if this wasn't a military base, a military operation, uh, Zento would not have been able to invoke the Rush Act. So now I, I noticed in the notes and in the reading that I was doing to get ready for the show, the Rush Act is named after Rush Limbaugh. Correct. Why? Do you have any clue? Mostly to tweak Rush's nose. Ah, okay. Joe Straczynski is not a huge Rush Limbaugh fan. But we'll keep we're gonna keep the politics we're gonna keep the politics out of the Babylon project. At least okay. current affairs <laughs> politics. <laughs> the idea behind the Rush Act, you notice it wasn't invoking the Rush Act didn't allow Zento to do anything necessary to end the strike. Right. It put Sinclair in the position to do anything necessary to end the strike. That's because of that military operation uh, aspect of it. Right. And what Zento thought was going to happen was all the civilian workers would be arrested and jailed by station security. Mm -hmm. And until and that would supposedly break the strike. Yep. That that is not what happened. Sinclair no. took whatever means necessary to end the strike, and in his case, it was actually fixing the problem. Yeah. By by invoking the Rush Act, I mean, he basically put the in the context of a military operation, so, you know, they couldn't even complain about his using military funding right. to address it. Right. He was on legal ground across the board here. Absolutely. And it was a decision that made the most sense. Now, I mean, to any what, thinking person. Right. What, what is, uh, what's going, what good is going to come from arresting all the workers, throwing them in jail with all those ships waiting to dock? It's not as if they're going to be able to, uh, ship in a bunch of scabs, especially when the docks are already full. Exactly. And you you know there's not enough military personnel on the station to do the job. Now, one question, th and this is something Anthony and I have talked about off and on every time we, we've watched it. Mm -hmm. When the fighting breaks out once the Rush Act is invoked, right? is it just me and Anthea, because we both sort of think the same thing after... She she had me go back and rewatch, and it's like, yeah, I think she's right. When Garibaldi grabs Connolly, uh -huh. it doesn't look like he's grabbing her to arrest her. He's shielding her, and it looks like he is shielding her and protecting her. Oh, I'd her absolutely her. agree. Yeah, I mean, he he's not arresting her as much as he was protecting her. Correct. I thought. Yeah. Okay. Good. So it's not it's, it's not just me. Well, see, in in my mind, as the as the union representative, it's not her job to tell them, tell the workers what to do. They tell her what they want to do. Right. And she is their representative, so she would represent them in in collective bargaining and so forth and so on. Uh, not not to dictate to them what they should, what they are to do. Uh huh. So, in, in essence, she's a civilian who is actually a part of the Union while still also being apart from the Union. Yeah. Which makes her probably a VIP, and that's why Garibaldi <laughs> grabbed her and got her out of the way. Yeah. Okay. Now, I don't know. I could be way off base. No, that, that does make sense to me. 
Well, there's probably a listener out there who is who who is way more familiar with union operations than I am. My field as a whole is not, you know, it's, it's not unionized. So my background and experience with trade unions is mostly from my dad's who was, I mean, he worked at steel mill, ran a backhoe member of uh, operating engineers. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. He, If he had worked anywhere else, he would have been oper- an operating engineer. At uh, the steel mill that he was at, he was part of the chemical workers. Yeah, my dad was a longshoreman. Uh-huh. And fortunately, he never went on strike, but he did go picket for other locals that were right. on strike every now and then. Uh, you know, my my knowledge of it is not extensive at all. But at any rate, I really liked what Sinclair said. Oh, we have to help. We have to hold on to that. Yes. When we get to when we get to the likes and dislikes, that's one of my three. Okay. Well, the other aspect of this story tonight was Jakar and Lando. Yes. Th- th- this was a Jakar Lando at the throat sort of story. Yes, yes, once again, um, <laughs> and it's all over a plant. Yeah, it's all over a flower. Jakar, we see a little of his spiritual side during the days of Jaquan. Mm-hmm. Part of those days of Jaquan is burning said flower as part of the ceremony. Unfortunately, that flower is destroyed and the accident that caused the whole union mess. Yes. However, there is one available. Just one. Just one. And, and guess, guess who's who holding on to it? He <laughs> got it. <laughs> Lando Malari. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Lando is wanting to use it for, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical purposes. <laughs> okay, that's better than acid trip. Pharmaceutical, Self- recreational pharmaceutical purposes. Yes, yeah, self medication type. <laughs> uh huh. And he is clearly enjoying himself. As a matter of fact, I think he's having more fun dangling this thing over Jakar's head rather than using it for what he had it intended to use it for. Oh, clearly, clearly that. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, J- the Jaquan F plant. And apparently the Narns use that for a ceremony that takes place on Narn where uh, sunlight peaks over a particular, a particular mountain. mountain for the followers of Jaquan. Right. It sounds a lot like, uh, like perhaps what might have gone on at Stonehenge. Yeah. You know, to mark the first day of spring, uh, the sun comes up between a certain set of stones or something like that. Sounds kind of similar to that. Which is an interesting way of putting it, because Lando considers the Narns all pagans. Yeah, well, you know, the, the funny thing about some some folks' religions is it's a singular point of view. Mm-hmm. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> okay. We did our philosophical episode last time, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just just some of the interactions and back and forth, some mutual stealing. You know, it starts out with seeing, we see Jakar's, quote, spiritual side, unquote, but he sure doesn't hesitate to throw that out the window to go back to his Conniving, I guess, is a good way of phrasing it. Right, yeah. Well, it just wouldn't be Jakar and Londo if they got along. <laughs> it just wouldn't work. I, I think I, I think Sinclair was ready to throttle them both. Yeah, well, they were only adding to what was already a situation. He was mediating other places I all don't over think, the place. I don't think I would have been as polite as Sinclair was when he realized this whole thing was over a flower. Well, you know, but at the same time, as a commander of the station, 
he realizes that there are beliefs that are sacred to Jakar's people that, and it needs to be respected. Indeed, and that that's one of the reasons why I do like Sinclair. Yeah, if he had said to Jakar on a knee-jerk reaction, look, all this is over a stupid plan? <laughs> well, he came close to that, though he left off the word stupid. Well, the thing is, is, you know, he he didn't, he didn't want to belittle their beliefs. And he, yeah, he was very good about that. You know, it reminds me, it just flashed in my head, it reminds me of something that I saw on the news many years ago. It was a CBS reporter, and they were standing out on the Gaza Strip, a CBS reporter and Anwar Sadat. Uh-huh. And the CBS reporter who apparently had no brains in his head, says to Anwar Sadat, you know, what's the big deal here? All it is is sand. It's just a strip of sand. What's the big deal? And Sadat reached down and he picked up a handful of sand and let it go through his fingers. And he says, Arizona is mostly sand. Do you feel that Arizona is worth fighting for? Yeah. So, uh, you know, you got to be careful. I had not heard that quote, but I love it. Yeah. Well, this oh, this was a long, long time ago. Of course, it would obviously have to be because Anwar Sadat's been gone for a right. long time. But it goes back to one of my long-standing sayings: "You can disagree completely, but you don't have to be disagreeable." Yeah, I like that. I like that. What one of my Raoulisms? I'm yeah. sure someone else has come up with it as well. But anyway, <laughs> Sinclair's solution. Sinclair solution. Well, we we got to remember that Jakar has managed to secure a representation of a, a Centauri deity, right? Okay, and kind of kind of like that. And so they're sitting in the in the conference room, and Sinclair decides that it's time to get this put down. Okay, and realizing that Jakar stole this statue, it needs to be given back. Yes. And the other side of that is being that the Jaquan F can be used as a narcotic, and it makes it an illegal thing to possess unless it's for religious purposes. You know, once again, he's... He, he well, I'll put it this way: He's got a knack at finding loopholes, doesn't he? Yeah, I'm surprised his first name isn't Solomon. <laughs> yeah, in fact, uh, Lando was one of the reasons Lando's so quick to agree is because, as far as Lando's concerned, he's already ruined Jakar's ceremony. Right. He, he thinks he's gotten. He thinks he's gotten his objective met. Yes, and Londo says, hey, I've already had my fun with the thing anyway, just take it. Uh-huh. But like I said, loopholes, Sinclair's good at finding them. Yeah, and and you know what? The the one that he came up with was something I would have never, ever thought of. But it was brilliant. It was. Why don't you go ahead and tell us what that is? Well, it turns out that, you know what? No. I think we'll let uh, Sinclair. I think we'll let Sinclair tell us it. Okay. Ambassador Jakar, when you have returned Londo's statue, I'll turn the Jaquan F over to you, and you'll compensate Londo for it full price. Why should I turn the statue over, assuming that I knew where it was when it's already too late for the ceremony? Molari knows that. That's why he gave in so easily. This ritual is supposed to be performed in the sunlight that has touched the Shaquan Mountain on a particular day at a particular time, right? Yes. But as your people went into space, it wasn't always possible to be at the foot of that mountain and pray in that sunlight. Yes, yes, if we can't be there, we must still make our prayers at the same moment as those on our planet. What you forgot to take into account is that sunlight also travels through space. Think about it. This station is 12.2 light years from Narn. That's just a little over 10 of your light years. The sunlight that touched Shaquan Mountain 10 of your years ago will reach this station in 12 hours. It's been on a long journey. 
but it's still the same sunlight. Good enough for you to conduct your ceremony. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. It might be. Commander, you are a far more spiritual man than I gave you credit for. There are a couple of Jesuit teachers I know who might disagree with you. I want that statue returned. I'm sure a careful search will turn it up. So basically, Sinclair's using the fact that, uh, okay, you get it timed right. You've got the light from the ceremony from 12 years ago that's going to hit Babylon 5. Yep. And in a way, it's, you know, I called it a loophole, but golly gee, in a way, it's, no, it's actually the most accurate. It's not temporal time, it's the actual light time. So wonder right. if he set a new uh, habit for uh, the Narn or a new practice for the Narn. Well, you know what they say. What do they say, Jim? Well, you know, it's like, you know, it's lunchtime somewhere. Somewhere every, somewhere in the world, it is 12 o'clock all the time. It's always lunchtime. Actually, right? the actual quote is, the sun's always under the yard arm somewhere. It's from Mame. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was the assistant director in high school when we did Mame. I was... I pretty darn near had the script memorized. <laughs> ah. Well, I was thinking more along the lines of friends of mine who used to talk about beer. You know, you can't drink uh -huh. beer before before work's over. The sun's well, always going, yeah. The sun's it's always five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> the sun's always going under the yard arm somewhere. Yes. That'd be about five o'clock-ish. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's go ahead and hit our likes and dislikes. I've mm -hmm. actually... I'm going to do my dislike first because there's only one of those and there's two things that I really like that I wanted to bring up. Okay. And it's more of a general. And it's not even Babylon 5. It's genre general. Have you ever noticed sort of a consistency with these genre sci-fi shows as far as the crew composition? Core team, captain, security chief, first officer, medical officer. Right. Why? At least, thank God, Babylon 5 didn't have a science officer. Ah. <laughs> they actually pull in specialized scientists whenever they need that. But why in the world is the medical officer always considered senior command staff? Well, you know... My experience, which is mostly from Star Trek, is the chief medical officer is actually the only person that can override the captain's orders. Agreed, but nevertheless, th think of it this way. It's a military or par they're always a military or paramilitary operation. Mm -hmm. I've yet to see a war movie where the captain's bringing the ship into combat. He's having his final strategy planning and there's the medical officer. There's the chief surgeon sitting there in the, <laughs> in the tactical meetings. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll give you that. On another plus, I think it's noteworthy that uh, Straczynski really didn't have uh, Franklin in this episode. Okay. But it's always been one of my beasts with the genre fiction. And the thing is, is, all right, this kind of goes back to original series Star Trek, right? <laughs> yes, and they're the ones that established it. That started it. And it had, in my mind at least, it had nothing <laughs> to do with the makeup of the personnel. But if you looked, if you watched the original series... McCoy and Spock represent the two sides of Kirk, the, lo the logical side and the compassionate side. And McCoy and Spock were always at each other's throats, just like it would be a conflict in a person. In indeed, I, I, I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to argue the yeast for which it's done. Okay. So they got to have some title. They got to have a job. You can't just have these guys running around the ship doing nothing. 
I, I, okay, like it, like I said, I, I'll I'll grant you the use to which it's put, and even <sighs> even on Voyager, the Doctor had a subroutine that allowed him to command the ship. So there it is. I think you just made my point though in that one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, it 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 just. Especially, I think it annoys me mostly on Babylon 5 because there's such a focus on realism and so many other aspects that falling back into, you know, or at least even just the flirting around the edges of that trope that it does Mm -hmm. just goes, makes me go. "Eh." Oh, see, it's, (laughs) it's, it's a, it's a formula that. It's a formula that doesn't bother me. As a matter of fact, I like it myself. I don't know. It, 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 it's, <laughs> I'm comfortable with it. <laughs> right. Well, that said, let's go on to my my first like. Susan Ivanova on the bridge. Her yes. countdown. Yes. That <laughs> was just precious, the way she cleared the bridge. I loved it. Yes. And then Garibaldi walking on to one. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, I, I, I wouldn't have been surprised if she had thumped him in the middle of the chest for that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was, it was really neat how uh, Sinclair comes on to the command center, followed by the reporter, blah, 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 blah. You couldn't really catch what she was saying because she was talking 500 miles a minute. And then and, Jakar and Lando come in, and reporter and, keeps looking for a quote. Yeah, and they're screaming at each other, and you got four or five people all talking at the same time. And the and, steam pouring out of Sinclair's ears at that point. Yeah, and that is the one place on the station that Sinclair should expect to not have to deal with that kind of thing. Exactly. And he leaves it to his first officer to address the problem. Wouldn't you? Oh, Totally, totally. <laughs> sick him, Susan. <laughs> sick him, Susan, exactly. And sick him, she does. <laughs> yeah. And in a way that nobody else could. And in a way that uh, everyone knows not to question or challenge. Absolutely. <laughs> now, my third, my, my third like is a quote. And it's Sinclair saying this. Kid, you can't do this. You're right, I couldn't, until you convinced the Senate to invoke the Rush Act. You should never hand someone a gun unless you're sure where they'll point it. Your mistake. Oh, I I have lived that one in my life in the past. <laughs> I, I love it. Yes. And that's the one redeeming quality of Hidoshi, is when he comes back, he lets Sinclair know he likes how he handled it personally, mm-hmm. but he needs to watch his back for that. Yeah. Sinclair has made some enemies because uh, Zento has, has some very powerful friends. We are going to see the results of that in just a few episodes, actually. Mm. Eyes. How about that? Part of Eyes is payback. Ah. Okay, and what else did you like? Those were my those were my three. I had the two likes and the one dislike. Okay. Well, my dislike is Zento, and you put it you put it in the notes quite eloquently. He's a slime ball. Yes. You know <laughs> he he's got this. He's he's a good looking guy, really slicked up. You know, dressing really really nice. Uh, coming in to pretend like, oh, I'm here to solve everybody's problems. and We're the government. We're here to help. Yeah. And the next thing you know, he is, he has turned ugly. He's yelling at Sinclair and making threats. And, and we throw... see what the government means by helping. Yeah. Throwing his, throwing his weight around. And, you know, as we said earlier, he's a hired gun. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. You've got it. Yeah. The one line that I really, really like in this is when they are negotiating at the table 
Uh, that would be Zento and Connolly. And she says... Every other guild on the station has signed their agreement. They understand that our government is not a bottomless pool of money. I don't care if they've agreed to wear bunny suits and sing the hallelujah chorus. We're not putting up with this kind of treatment from Earth Central any longer. If you refuse to negotiate in good faith, you leave us no choice. Her line in that exchange just absolutely cracks me up every time. And you know what? It, it's a Garibaldi line almost. It's a Garibaldi line. That is a Garibaldi line. It could even be a Susan line. But uh yeah, it, it but it's funny. It's just great. I'm going to use it. <laughs> and I you know, I think that's why I liked her character so much. The the was sort of a really enjoyable mix of Susan and Garibaldi in her. Yes. Yeah, good. I, I well, you know, I never thought of it that way, but yeah. Neither did I until just this very moment. <laughs> but yeah, I, I definitely have to agree with you on that on that line. It is it is totally a great line. Beyond that, this was a one a one off episode. Didn't really pull a whole lot together from outside itself. It it will have ramifications in future episodes. However, it was a one off, but it was a fun one off. Yeah, it was a I guess you could call it a ship in a bottle episode. <laughs> yep. That that does, you know, there's one last thing that I will note, and this is one of the scenes that I really love. And it's not because of the ceremony, Jakar ceremony with uh, the Jaquanath. Mm -hmm. It's the setting of it. You know, usually when, you, when you're in the observation, when you're in C&C, &C, mm -hmm. you know, the star field's fixed, so you don't get that sense of the station being in rotation. Mm -hmm. When they're on that observation deck doing that ceremony, You've got that star field rolling in the big windows behind you as the station rotates. Yes. And it's like, I keep finding myself doing this, and since folks can't see it, I have to describe it. It's like, I keep kind of leaning to the right, because the star, field, the star field's motion kind of makes everything seem slightly off-center, but that it, it's dead-on accurate. You know what? That brings something to mind. Okay. All right. So the star field in the observation deck moves. The star field on the command center does not. Now, supposedly it's spinning because of to maintain gravity. So why don't they have zero G on the command center? What uh, it, provides the gravity? The command center is not completely at the center axis. It's about uh, a third of the way out. So it has gravity, but it is low G. It's lowered gravity. It's about a third, third to a half, I think it was a third that he said in the past, Earth norm. Okay. So if Susan had gotten a hold of everybody and thrown them physically off of the command center, they would have gone quite a ways. They would have gone quite a ways. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> it would have been an easy throw because, of course, everyone still has their mass, but... Yeah. <laughs> Mass and weight are not the same things. No, they are not. But yeah, it, it, it does have. It does have, and the reason you don't see the Starfield rotation from C and C is, I mean, just the budget to do it would have been. It would have blown the budget. Yeah, of course. So anyway, that was that was one of the things that I did. I did just realize I should have brought up. I, I have to say though that Jakar probably shouldn't sing. <laughs> Oh God! You and my wife. She's she's gonna crack up laughing when I tell when I tell her that. However, when he did that song, I'm thinking the, the of fishies. Thinking, yes, I I thought that was great. <laughs> yeah, but the man should not be a canter. <laughs> Gosh, you and Anthea, you 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 and Anthea, exactly the exactly the same thing. Oh yeah. my gosh! <laughs> uh, and you know, I think that is a perfect note to leave us on tonight. Sounds good. We 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 have definitely had some fun with this one, and that's a good thing because next week is going to be signs and portents. Yes, definitely a. Big major wham episode. Mm -hmm. So, my friend, a good time tonight. Yes, fun, fun show. 
Oh, one last thing I do want to mention. And guys, if you haven't listened to Sci-Fi Diner, I am really going to encourage you to do so. Scott Herzog, Miles McLaughlin, M. Uh, they they do a wonderful show. You you really want to listen to it if you don't. I was a guest on the show discussing Firefly. I just listened to that episode. Uh, finished listening to it on the way to work this morning. Aha! And it was it was an excellent episode. I really enjoyed it. I love that series. So so the the chance to get on the diner to talk about what actually is three of my favorite episodes, in fact, yes. was just I, it was just something I couldn't pass up. And if I could just toss a little teaser, we talk about three of my favorite episodes: Ariel, War Stories, and Trash. So it was a great time. Yeah, a lot of a lot of fun to listen to. I highly recommend it. All right, Jim. So, no boom today? No boom today. Boom tomorrow. There's always a boom tomorrow. Absolutely. Good night, folks. Good night now. Podcast terminated. Thank you for listening to the Babylon Project Podcast. You can email Raul and Jim at the Babylon Project Podcast at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook at the Babylon Project Podcast. On the internet, we are at Babylon Project Podcast WordPress.com. To subscribe to the podcast, you can find us on iTunes or you can subscribe to the RSS feed on the webpage.